Okay, there we go. Mm. Thank you everyone for tuning in for VPK by Maharshi Ayurveda. I'm Valerie Brown and this is our Behavioral, behavioral Rasayana, the Influence of Ayurvedic Habits webinar. Have you ever noticed that when you're happy, maybe your body feels more healthy? Well, according to Ayurveda, there's an intimate connection between our state, our mind state of health and its effect on the body's well-being. And there's a comprehensive list of daily choices and routines that can help us achieve good health and happiness. And joining us today is integrative doctor, Ayurvedic expert and author, Nancy Lonsdorf. Thank you, Dr. Lonsdorf, for being here. Great to be here with you, Val. Definitely. Now, this is such an interesting topic and timely for this time of the year as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's, yeah, let's get right into it. What exactly is this term, Rasayana? What does this mean? Rasayana means literally, rasa means the essence, or we think of it as the the byproduct or our what our food breaks down into, but it has even a subtler uh, concept meaning the subtlest, the most refined essence of our food, which is called ojas. And uh, ayana means the path to or what, what promotes that. So it's all about what kind of behaviors we should have in the day that's promoting the subtlest level of the body intelligence that kind of keeps everything balanced, keeps everything healthy, keeps every cell doing what it's supposed to do. So that's, that's called ojas, and all of Ayurveda is said to be really oriented towards enhancing this life-giving essence. Now, what, could you explain this connection that's there between the mind and the body, and it goes both ways? How, can you explain it to us? <laughs> well, I think uh, Ayurveda has told us that the, the gap between mind and body you know, we, we think of, well, mind is consciousness. We know it influences body. We're not quite sure how somehow consciousness influences our brain or our brain creates consciousness. Nobody really knows. But we do know there's an intimate connection. And Ayurveda says, you know, we can use that for good or for bad. So um, better we use it for good. So our mind and our emotions have a very big impact on our whole psychophysiology because they influence our emotions, that part of our brain, and that influences our hormones and our nervous system, and that goes to every part of the body. So immediately when we have a thought or a worry or a fear or a positive emotion, whatever we're doing, it influences the body. So I was going to show a few slides to illustrate that. Would you like that? Sounds great. Okay, so the first slide, it says balance is the key to perfect health. And that is really the basic premise of Ayurveda and Maharishi Ayurveda is that balance is the key to perfect health. So all of the recommendations that are behavioral rasayana means what we can do that promotes this life-giving force and promotes our health and our longevity Ayurveda describes about 19 different and lists 19 different behaviors. And of course, we have many, many more that we know from diet and digestion and how to improve um, how our body handles the food we eat and what we should eat and when we should eat it and when should we should go to sleep. And all of these principles of Ayurvedic behavior, they're all to enhance ojas. But the behavioral rasayana per se is a little bit oriented also to the spiritual and those elements of our mind and consciousness. And it shifts the focus more in that direction. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. And what we have, of course, we know the doshas, the vata governing our nervous system and hormones, and then pitta, our digestion metabolism, kapha, the building up of our physical structure. And we know that all of the recommendations of Ayurveda are aimed at keeping these three functions, super functions, I like to call them, of the body in balance. So we're all on the same page when we're talking about balancing doshas, we're talking about behaviors of diet or eating and eating habits and sleep habits that we know from Ayurveda, and we're talking about behavioral rasayana or rejuvenation. Now, skipping to the emotional part and the mental part. So one of the great texts of Ayurveda, 
Sushruta Samhita. Sushruta was the first surgeon uh, recognized by even modern surgery as the, the father of modern surgery. And he was also a great Vaidya. And he wrote that when the emotional heart is balanced, then one gains pure knowledge. That's a spiritual value of pure knowledge. The desires of the mind are always righteous. In other words, spontaneously, we know what the right thing to do is for ourselves and our others. And one experiences unbounded bliss. So what he's saying is that everything that promotes balanced emotional state is supportive of our spiritual growth, our spirituality, and the development of really higher states of, of being or of consciousness. So the opposite of that is that we know negative emotions can increase problems like in even heart disease. I think the heart, because Ayurveda says the seat of consciousness is in the heart, so our emotions especially affect heart. And it says that emotions that can increase heart disease include worry or anger, hostility, and depression. So having those chronically in one's life are, are a big risk factor for having heart disease later. There's even one condition, I just threw this in because I think it's a kind of a dramatic uh, example of this, is there's something called broken heart syndrome that uh, particularly in women, that when one undergoes a very, very strong stress that creates a lot of cortisol, we know that cortisol is our stress hormone, like out of control cortisol, that cortisol can actually damage the heart and one can um, go to the emergency room and the doctors think you're having a heart attack, it looks like a heart attack, the heart actually can um, start to expand and, and like part of the heart muscle actually got damaged, but it can also spontaneously revert back to normal after a while. So it's not actually that there's a heart attack, but just that stress can actually affect the physical matter of the heart. So really important that uh, we monitor and we do all we can to keep our emotional brain and emotional heart in balance. So the opposite of it is that our optimism and positive states are actually good for our heart and good for our overall health. So they're, uh, keeping a positive outlook is actually one of the major behavioral resinas and there's still research going on as how much one can you know change one's ways and and adapt uh, a new way of looking at it maybe you feel you're a born pessimist or you always see the cup half full but ayurvedic contends as does a lot of modern psychology that and um positive psychology and coaching and all the things that help people you know, realize their potential, that we do have a large degree and element of choice. So this is what Ayurveda tells us, is that we always choose that which will be healthier. Um, it's always good to watch a funny movie. That's one thing you can do <laughs> because laughter itself lowers blood pressure and laughing for 10 to 15 minutes, that blood pressure effect lasts 24 hours. So maybe instead of taking blood pressure medicine, unless of course you need it, and I will always tell people to, to take their blood pressure medicine is one of the most important things for their long-term health, but maybe you're just on the borderline. Maybe all you need to do is laugh for 15 minutes a day, read some funny cartoons or a joke book or watch a funny movie, and that is going to keep your blood pressure down for 24 hours. In fact, just looking at people laughing, I think is good for our health. So just another way to show that connection between mind and body, uh, this is work done by a company named HeartMath, and they looked at how the breath and the heart beat are connected. And we know that even from modern medicine, when one breathes in, if you're, you've got a healthy system, your heart rate goes up. And when you breathe out, your heart rate goes down. And there should be a very balanced kind of smooth sine wave like you see in the bottom here. And this is somebody feeling appreciation. And what they found is that their heart rate tracked their breath rate in a very predictable and balanced and coherent way. But if somebody was frustrated, angry, upset, their 
heart rate did not track their breath rate. It was all disorderly and chaotic. And that is a stressed heart. That is a stressed system. So we see here, even on a, a breath and beat to beat moment, how our emotions are affect our heart rate and our whole nervous system. And as I mentioned, Ayurveda says the seed of consciousness is in the heart. And one who wants to protect the heart, the great vessels and ojas, as we're talking about behavioral rejuvenation or resina is that which promotes this life-giving substance that's as much matter as it is consciousness, as much mind as it is matter, according to Ayurveda. One should particularly avoid the causes due to affliction of the mind. And in fact, people who have these positive emotions of they're hopeful, they exercise forgiveness, they feel loved and they have people that they love, they have social support in their life. And if they have prayer or faith, all of these different factors contribute to less illness, getting sick less and recovering more quickly if one does get sick. Uh, one of the things one can do, Ayurveda tells us that transcending is the best among the sources of health. So, you know, one can only do so much sometimes choosing to be positive. If you've got a big backload of stress on your system or you're just totally overloaded every day by what's coming at you, then of course meditation is very popular today and it's understood to help reduce stress. So because Ayurveda says that transcending is the best among the sources of health, transcendental meditation is a key part of Maharishi Ayurveda. And so much research has shown the benefits of transcendental meditation for health and mental health, reducing anxiety and physical health. And here was just an example. I think especially reducing heart attack, stroke, uh, death by 50% in people who were at high risk. So it's very potent effect that our mind has on our body. So we want to use that to the max. Now we have um, a beautiful expression for one of the behavioral resinas in terms of being choosing a positive attitude. So this is uh, from the Upanishads, a part of the Veda, which Ayurveda comes from the same tradition in India, this ancient, ancient wisdom. And it says, let us be radiating truth, radiating the light of life. Never shall we denounce anyone, never entertain negativity. And I want to spend an extra moment on that because today, especially with our social media and our news and so much information coming at us, and of course, negative news gets stirs up the most uh, response. So there's a bias to reporting the negative news. So we're inundated by negative messages and emotional upsets today. So the idea of why we, it says, never shall we denounce anyone. Because when we start to think about what we are really unhappy with and we complain and we put somebody down or we look at the negative in the other person, you know, whether they're a very prominent public figure or there's someone in our family or a friend or someone at work or someone we barely know. When we put our attention on the negative in that person, we enliven that negative in our own heart. So we don't want to do that to ourselves. If we don't want to draw that upset and frustration, anger, and enliven that purposely, you know, just by dwelling on something or reading the news and every day letting ourselves get all caught up in all sorts of negative feelings. So never entertain negativity. Now, the flip side of that, we also don't want to just try to make a mood or try to just suppress negative thoughts or pretend they're not there or deny or shove them out and, and try to hold them back because that doesn't really work either. You know, we have to be natural, but there comes a point, And the idea here is that that point can be pretty early in the process. When we start to dwell in something, we start to think about something negative, we can shift our attention or we, we can find something positive in it, or we can just put our attention on something else that makes us feel more inspired and more proactive to do something good for the world. 
because really we don't do any good when we're caught up in this negative mode. We just only can do good and create more light. We can only bring in more light when we are inspired and we are contributing what we feel is good, what we can do that will be helpful. So that's a really, I think, just a key point today. And as we start the new year, um, I think, Val, you always ask me, what's my one favorite recommendation? I would say this is my one favorite recommendation for 2020, is really that we pay some attention to this, this, um, this attention and understand the power that what we put our attention on really grows stronger inside us physiologically, as well as grow stronger in our life. So let's bring in light and let's radiate light and good things to those around us. And this is our great Albert Einstein that I think, I don't think he has an enemy anywhere. And he was a wonderful man. And in his later life, he wrote beautiful um, quotables that have been quoted. And really, he, um, he was very deep and very simple and good hearted. And he said, the value of a man should be seen in what he gives and not in what he is able to receive. And he also was quoted saying something like um, that, you know, he realized in life that the most important thing really in life is what you give to other people. And I think being such an incredible brain, uh, Albert Einstein, that, you know, him coming to the realization, what's important, maybe it wasn't as important to realize E equals MC squared and turn the whole world of science upside down for centuries, but, but really that it was what he felt that he was giving. And I don't think he meant just on the level of an insight, but really to give from the level of love to other people. And there is something called helper's high there's a helper's high and, and they find that actually when we give to another person, that same part of our brain that lights up, like say somebody gives us money or we win the lottery, that same part of our brain lights up when we give something to another person. So I think that, you know, that's a really great thing to keep in mind. So, so lastly, um, you know, just one thing I wanted to say is this OGIS has to flow through physical channels. So Ayurveda puts a lot of attention on keeping the channels open, the shrot as they call it. So here we have a lady sipping some hot water with a little lemon. And that's one of my favorite recommendations. So you keep your channels open so that your circulation to every part of your body is good and brings this life-giving OGIS to every cell. And well, morning walk also is said to be one of the most rejuvenating uh, habits that we can have. And here we have great uh, Sage Charka, a teacher of Ayurveda. And he said that the best thing that anyone can do costs no money. We can all do it every day. He said, wake up early in the morning and take a walk in the light of the rising sun. So, um, well, we got the 19 to come. I'm anticipating a question from you, maybe Val. I know you you are at Marish Ayurveda Products, and and these are the favorite my favorite physical things in Earth on Earth are the products of Marish Ayurveda and all these beautiful herbs, and I've been using them in my practice for over 30 years now. And the very one of the very first herbs that came out was Amrit Kalash, and Amrit Kalash is a Rasayana. So we talk about behavioral resinas, those things that promote ojas or that life-giving substance that keeps us healthy and living long. Well, there are also herbs that do that. There are combinations of herbs like Amrit Kalash. And this is the Amrit Kalash uh, four and five, meaning the ambrosia and the nectar given to people who had high cholesterol. And what it did was dramatically reduce the amount of oxidation of the LDL, of the bad cholesterol. It's only when it gets oxidized that it gets laid down in your arteries and causes blockages, like heart attacks or strokes. So one of my favorite recommendations to patients, and I'm giving this every day, is the Amrit Kalash, particularly the nectar tablet, because the tablet of the nectar has no sugar or ghee, so 
people avoiding are on keto, they don't have a problem. People avoiding saturated fats don't have a problem with it. And it's very powerful, just as powerful as the paste form of it, the traditional. And I really haven't found any case in which it's unhealthy for a person or we have a conflict with their medication or something like that. So I recommend the Amrit Nectar tablet very liberally and even a double dose of it two twice a day if somebody's really trying to recover from surgery or prepare for something or or just is under lots of stress that two twice a day is a really really potent strengthener so i think i've come to the end of my slides val i'm going to um stop the screen share and then uh oops i've got the i've got the 19 we've been promising you so can can should we read why don't you read them val i've been talking a lot why don't you read them um, I'll, I'll put the screen back up. Okay, thank you. In a moment. Yeah, this is exciting to see this whole list all compiled just like this. Yeah. Uh, so we start with being truthful without, without uh, being cunning. Or Yeah, I wanted to just uh, interject something. I think we've all known that if we have a secret that we're holding from someone that's maybe not so pleasant, that we feel a stress about it all the time. So being straightforward in our life is really important. Mm -hmm. Maintain balanced sleep and wakefulness. Seven to eight hours of sleep at night is a huge factor in health, especially those that are over 65, really uh, increases quite dramatically the risk of heart disease if you don't sleep at least seven hours. Mm. Be free of anger and practicing nonviolence. Be calm. Do not strain. I know we hear that one a lot. Will you talk a little bit about this one, Dr. Lonstor? Physically not straining or emotionally not straining or all of this? I think everything, but um, on the other hand, we see number seven, be sweet spoken. So maybe we strain a little bit to restrain if it's not appropriate, you know. Ayurveda doesn't say to um, get it all out at the expense of those around us. Uh, but I think that the idea here physically, for example, is don't spend your health to gain wealth is one of the expressions, because then later in life, you'll be spending all your wealth to try to regain your health. That's one of the sayings. And the idea is that if we chronically strain, I mean, maybe there's a deadline here that we have to strain for a day or two or a little bit. But if we're constantly burning the candle at both ends, we're going to burn our ojas, basically. We're burning our life force, and that's going to deteriorate our immunity and set us up for a disease. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep that balance in life. And emotionally, you know, that's why one practices things like meditation and gets out in nature, and we do things that help to dissipate the emotional and, and mental stress as it comes in. Mm -hmm. And, and you mentioned already meditation, so there it is again, another great reminder. Oops, there we go. Persevere. Right, so I think this is also important. Some people, some people think, oh, if, if the universe doesn't uh, support this easily, then I'll just not do it, or I'll do something else. And I think perseverance is one of the recommendations because often we really don't accomplish what we want unless we persevere. It's not just that we are going to have everything fall into place and alignment, you know, at every step of the way and having that goal of what we want and, and sticking to it and keeping coming back to the course. That's often how somebody really achieves something. And achievement's important for us to feel fulfilled in life. So I would just encourage people, don't give up. Don't look to every little, this happened or this came and this was good, but this was bad. And, and look to everything as if it's some sign from the universe, you know? Um, <laughs> you know, if you, if you get 10 really huge roadblocks in a row, you might want to think about it and you're not happy. Maybe there's a better thing to put your your efforts into, but don't just give up if you really believe in something and you really want it. Mm -hmm. Now, pursuing universal or spiritual knowledge. Yes, and, and if you are a religious person, that could mean practicing your religion and uh, 
if you are not a religious person, it may be developing your spirituality or exercising meditation, or maybe just being always committed to the highest ideals and living your values in life. So it's uh, growing, growing in that way, pursuing it, uh, developing yourself. Mm -hmm. And being giving, giving and charitable. Yeah, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when we give, sometimes there's a little barrier to do it because sometimes we might feel, oh, I'm going to lose this thing. But what we gain, I think everyone experiences when we get that gratitude or even even sometimes we don't get gratitude on the other side, but we know we have that satisfaction that we did the right thing. And that is a really important part of life and health. Mm -hmm. Practicing cleanliness, number 12. Yeah, I think we, we're pretty good at that in modern life. <laughs> if not, somebody usually tells us about it. <laughs> All right, keep it, keeping the company of elders. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, I think this is a beautiful point. Um, we are pretty much a youth worshiping country. And when people, you know, get senior and more senior, they can have a tremendous amount of wisdom to share. And we can gain from that. And the idea is not just keeping the company of our peers. And if we're elder, then it is our peers. But <laughs> But the idea also, I think, implied here are people of wisdom that are um, maybe more senior and are leaders and are um, wise in certain ways. And in fact, there are other uh, recommendations within the Vedas, like keep the company of the enlightened, keep the company of people who radiate and exemplify what you want to be and do in your life. Hmm. Love that. Um, being loving and compassionate. Oh, that's always easy, isn't it? <laughs> Especially with our family members. It's a good uh, well, reminder. Yeah, it's a good reminder. And I think, I think uh, when we take care of ourselves and we're not straining, we're getting enough rest, we, I think most of us experience that it's a lot easier to be our best self. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, do not be conceited. Yes, and I think um, the people who are conceited need to read the behavioral recina, but they might be the least likely <laughs> to recognize that they need to work on that. <laughs> but I think the idea here is not, they're not saying be selfless. They're not saying that. But I think the idea here is balance. And, you know, fill your own cup, but then let it overflow to others. And be alert to others, not everything being totally, you know, self-centric. And I think this is also kind of a, an important point in our life today because there's so much um, talk of our narcissistic kind of society. And I think the good part of it, especially in, say, America, is that we have always valued independence. We have always championed the individual and our own efforts and our own achievements. But on the other hand, it has to, everything always has to be in balance. So we have to do it in a way that nurtures the others around us as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And behaving well with everybody. I think the everybody is, is <laughs> we can underline this, isn't it? And, and we can behave well, you know, all day long and then we go home and maybe we have an annoying uh, family member or something <laughs> that, that stirs us up. Well, there's a, also a saying that when you don't feel well or you're not in a good mood, just be on your best behavior. And, you know, it may, it may take a little bit of strain, but not a big strain. And the payoff is going to be much better than not straining a little, you know, because we, we will not have that negativity coming back at us when, when we snap at somebody. <laughs> no being respectful of teachers, mentors, and elders. I think this is, this is a very cultural thing. In some cultures, it's very natural. And um, I think that it's important, again, balance. We don't necessarily, it doesn't mean we have to take whatever a teacher says at school or a mentor for granted or yes, 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 sir, or yes, 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 ma'am, mm -hmm. but be respectful. So if you, it's always good to ha use your intellect and to question things, um, but the idea is to do it in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. And then not overindulging in alcohol or sexual activity. 
Hmm. Yes, alcohol is said to have the exact opposite effects of ojas. Hmm. So one great Vaidya, once when I asked him um, in a consultation with another person that I felt was overindulging in alcohol, I asked, well, Dr. Triguna it was, his name, Dr. Triguna, what about alcohol? And he said, this much, meaning probably about an ounce or two, he said, this much in the right season for the right person is nectar. Wow. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. So he said, but more than that, it's poison. Wow. So overindulging is the, is the w word here. And uh, so avoiding overindulging. And sexual activity, interestingly, sperm and, and um, ovum are, are said to be, are called shukra in Ayurveda. And shukra is the final physical product of digestion or it's the level of metabolism or part of the body that is nourished last. But it's said to be very close to ojas. So if we drain ourselves of shukra too much, too much, we can weaken our ojas. And especially, you know, being mindful of appropriateness for your age and time of life, like young people have a lot of ojas and they have a lot of sexual drive and it's more natural to be more active. But if one is 75, I have once had a patient, he and his wife went on a retreat, which was uh, Kama Sutras, and it was all about you know, sex, basically. And I was a little concerned because I felt his pulse and I felt he was, even though he looked vital and, and everything, he didn't look that ojacy. Mm -hmm. And I was a little concerned that he was going to go for, you know, a week and just, you know, get rid of a lot of, a lot of shukra and, and ojas. So indeed, um, unfortunately, it could have been totally coincidence, but he, he didn't, didn't live very much longer after that. And uh, that's just an anecdote. It doesn't have anything to do with science. But I would say that, um, you know, one has to be mindful and moderation. And we find the people who live the longest and oldest and best, they always talk about moderation. They're not necessarily even non-smokers or n not drinking at all or anything. They just have balance of life. We go back to that first slide I showed that Ayurveda says the key to perfect health is balance of life. Hmm. Yeah. And then the last one, which you already mentioned too, is simply maintaining a positive outlook. There we go. So when we have a choice, we choose the positive, or at least we choose not to entertain the negative, mm -hmm. not to entertain the negative. Mm -hmm. These are wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, I imagine that you actually prescribe these to your patients, Dr. Lonsdorf? Yes, uh, judiciously, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't just hand everyone 19 and say, now do this tomorrow. <laughs> but, you know, there are so many recommendations that come up in uh, a consultation, and most of them tend to be on the herbal ricinas and the diet and the digestion and the keeping the channels open so ojas can flow. But, you know, um, it's not uncommon that one feels I can feel in the pulse and every clinician I think senses whether they address it or not when somebody's under a lot of stress mm -hmm. or maybe they're down about something and you can see the influence of the mind and this the emotions on a person and I pick the one or two of these that I think is the most going to be the most impactful for them and recommend it usually we, it starts often with meditation and also this balance of life not straining, getting more rest, and being um, more regular with their whole routine. Mm -hmm. These are wonderful. And I can say from the receiving end, I've been in a consultation before where, yeah, I had the pulse reading, and then the very first recommendation was really simple. It was one of these behavioral recyanists, and I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I need to do. <laughs> and, and it was... You know, it's been challenging, but it's definitely the one that I needed the most outside of really any of the herbs or anything. It was like, here's what will really change everything. It was interesting. Yeah, yeah very interesting. We're, we, we get so focused on a pill for an ill, even with herbs and, and food. Everybody's obsessed about what they eat and how much of this or that. But these behavioral resinas are influencing our whole physiology as strongly as what we're eating 
and when we're sleeping. So this is why I really appreciate you bringing this topic up and that gives us a chance to share this beautiful prescription to everyone. Yeah, this is wonderful. And it's so simple. And like you were saying in one of the other, other slides that it's, it costs nothing to do these behavioral recinas. Yes, and you know, one doesn't have to feel bad if you read through these 19 and think, well, I'm only doing seven of them. What am I going to do? How am I going to ever get them all? You know, it's not about uh, doing everything perfectly. It's, it's about now that you have the awareness of them, just kind of having them in your mind. And when you have that moment of choice of, of being deciding to be, you know, angry for another half hour about this thing that happened in the news or putting your attention on something else or going and you know, calling a friend that's lonely or, or whatever it is, you know, you can make that choice and it's going to be giving you benefit at the same time as the other person in the world. So just uh, also the more one is uh, enlivening your own inner, your own inner consciousness and your own resina in internally through your spiritual development and your commitment to just you know, living the best life, then the more these things will come naturally, you won't ever have to think about them. You can just read them once a year, maybe in January and say, oh, wow, yeah, I really became more loving and compassionate this year. Or, oh, you know, I made a point last year of giving more and boy, that felt good. And, and then you see that you're spontaneously starting to do more and more of these. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you for sharing this list with us and, and just breaking it down really simply for us, Dr. Lonsdorf. Now, are there any final insights or encouragement that you could share? Oh, just, just be happy. Just focus on doing those things that make you feel good about yourself, that give something positive to the world. Maintain your inner bliss and ojus through taking care of yourself it's really it's only a full cup that can overflow to other people so keep your cup full <laughs> that's wonderful thank you so much for being here with us and thank you everyone for tuning in we hope you enjoyed the presentation uh, we will include a link for you that includes an article that Dr. Lonsdorf wrote um, about the behavioral recinas. And if there's any other topics that you'd like to see us cover, feel free to reach out and let us know. Thanks for tuning in.